Good morning to everyone. Thank you for all those who made the time to be here from near and far from across town. I know some of you have made the long trip. Um, welcome to this talk that we're presenting this morning. Um, just a little bit about the archives that's hosting this talk. The archives at NCBS, we're a, we're a public collecting center for the history of contemporary and science, contemporary science in India. And that basically means all STEM fields for the last 100 or 200 years. And we look at not just um, institutions and uh, scientific research, but also people's movements, um, citizen science, and so on. Um, I'll hand over to Satyajit Nehru, who will introduce uh, our speaker for today. Well, um, <clears throat> let, uh, let me first of all welcome all of you um, on uh, Tuesday morning. It's actually not that common to have an almost full hall. So thank you for coming. Um, well, you know, uh, before uh, we get uh, Dr. Anama Spudic, uh, or Anna as we call her, to give her seminar on European records of botanical medical knowledge of Southern India, uh, resources for contemporary biomedical science. I mean, that's a mouthful, and I'm sure she's going to unpack that for all of us. Um, and uh, But I'd like to say a few words about her. Uh, I, I got to know Anna, um, as we refer to her, when she and Jim, uh, uh, who her husband, who uh, first came to spend a small sabbatical, uh, well, actually a long sabbatical at NCBS in 2005. And uh, I must say, NCBS and the campus have never been the same again. Um, Anna um, received her PhD um, in the life sciences and pursued postdoctoral work in molecular cell biology, like many of us. Um, but she did it at Stanford University in the 60s and the 70s, and then carried out research in cell biology, uh, also at Stanford, for the next uh, 25 years. Uh, she was also visiting faculty at the Department of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology at the University of California. San Francisco, and a visiting scientist at Genentech. But then um, she decided uh, that she would shift gears completely and leave behind uh, basic science to devote her intellectual energies and her, to her lifelong interest, which she had, of course, uh, um, you know, inculcated along the, year, along the way, um, in the history of Indian scientific traditions uh, especially those rooted in the biomedical sciences. So in recognition of her uh, both contribution to this area, in 2003, uh, Anna was invited to curate an exhibit uh, and organize a conference uh, at the Cantor Center for Visual Arts uh, at Stanford. And the exhibit <clears throat> from foreign places, all variety of herbs, and the conference, The Seeds of Culture, Look to the contribution of ethnobotany to modern science uh, and was also underwritten by the School of Medicine and the Department of Asian Religions and, uh, and Cultures at Stanford. So, of course, one can see the conflation of both history and medicine uh, building up in Anna's work. In 2008, in fact, um, we invited Anna to, to curate an exhibit here in Bangalore, which was uh, quite, quite a groundbreaking exhibition. Um, on the influence of early Indian scientific knowledge in pre-modern Europe, uh, titled Such Treasure and Rich Merchandise, Indian Botanical Knowledge in the 16th and 17th European Books. Uh, this uh, book, um, and some of its pages are displayed on our walls and uh, on our, um, uh, on our windows outside, and so you might want to see them as you go out. And the exhibit itself about the material in the book is still in our garden outside. So in fact, you'll see uh, exhibits of that exhibition still in our garden outside. Um, and I must say, this was an extraordinary uh, opening out of um, how one could use um, uh, uh, archival material to, to create uh, new knowledge, a new understanding. And I must say, was perhaps one of the seeds of the archive itself uh, at, at NCBS. So this, uh, uh, this um, exhibition is also now currently on display uh, in collaboration with NCBS at the Google Digital Cultural Archive. <clears throat> she has published many articles and talks in a variety of learned magazines and conferences. And her current work, as you will see, is focused on the history and living traditions of Indian botanical medical knowledge and the impact of that knowledge on medicine and botany in European and Pan-Asian worlds in the early modern period. 
she um, Anna continues her to uh, to uh, uh, visit us um, as a visiting scholar, uh, where um, in her last engagement before COVID, in fact, this is her first visit in five years, uh, she had put together an exhibition for our 25th year, uh, called also called The Seeds of Culture, focusing again on uh, the uh, um, ancient Indian traditions and uh, in knowledge, botanical knowledge and how that tra uh, transfer of information happens uh, into other uh, cultures. So, um, so uh, her journey to understand how botanicals and traditional medical practices uh, have always been intertwined, deriving strength from a very open and um, understanding of both science and uh, traditional practice. And this is, I think, uh, very missing today in today's discourse on the same topic. And I and I wish urge people would try and you know try and bring both mo modern scientific knowledge as well as their understanding of tra traditional um, me traditional um, medical knowledge to to one place in one's brain in the same way that Anna does. Um, anyway, today, uh, <clears throat> um, well, I I I should say that um, it's been a tremendous inspiration and pleasure knowing Anna and Jim and having them at NCBS for all these years and on our campus for over uh, over the 20 years now. Uh, I'm very glad that Anna has continued to engage with us. And, and she's also enriched our archives with some of the material that she has collected. Uh, also grateful to that. Uh, and I hope that she will serve um, uh, to and continue her association with us uh, for time to come. So um, please uh, join me in welcoming Anna to deliver her talk here today. But thank you, Jitu, for that wonderful introduction. I'm not sure I recognize myself, but on the other hand, um, I will try to live up to uh, all those wonderful comments. Uh, it's it's a tremendous pleasure to be at the NCBS to see more friends and uh, you know participating and remembering all the wonderful things that we did together. And but I this talk is going to be just an introduction for I hope for many of you who are experimental scientists to a wonderful resource for modern science, which is also part of our traditional knowledge systems. And so why should you be listening to a talk about old you know, books and plants and so on? Well, I've spelled them out for you. First, it's of historical interest because in the Indian knowledge traditions and has a very important place in history and in the knowledge development as we know it today, especially in the scientific knowledge development in all arenas in physics, mathematics, astronomy, and certainly in biology and medicine. That has not received the attention it deserves. So secondly, uh, Indian knowledge systems, especially in biomedical sciences, had a critical place in the early colonial enterprise. And that is a, acknowledge, that acknowledgement still needs to be made. While around the world, you know, objects of art, you know, like the Benin bronzes and all these important artifacts are being acknowledged as being products of other societies and being returned to their original, original places. We have contributed as a nation, as a culture, tremendous amount of information that has contributed to the success of the colonial enterprise. And that knowledge cannot be repatriated. I don't, I don't think we are asking for it, but it should be acknowledged. And so that is my second thesis. And thirdly, the most important thing that I want to point out to you is the vast body of literature about, about Indian traditional medicine that was actually recorded in European books, most of which are very easily accessible to us. And I don't think that we have actually looked at it as a source for information, especially when it comes to biomedicine. Okay. This is to a fond recollection and also to um, um, talk about the first exhibition that we did uh, at the NCBS that Jiddu referred to. And I must not be lax in uh, but not acknowledging the you know, tremendous um, warmth that we were received with when we first joined the NCBS uh, to Professor Vijay Rakhman for inviting me to join the NCBS as a visiting fellow and to Professor Mayer for making it possible for me to be associated with this institution and supporting my work over the last many years. And these are two scenes from the exhibition we did in 2008. On the left is a drop down, which was at the entrance to this building, which was from a book, an herbal, a 16, uh, late 16th century um, British herbal by John Gerard, 
in, introduce um, an image of an Indian pika tree. And in collaboration with Sari Tusundar, who was the designer, this drop down was the entrance into the exhibition. It was very dramatic. Then all over the uh, various parts of the NCBS campus, we had pages from the 16th, 17th century Dutch manuscript on Indian medicines put together by uh, the Dutch governor of Malabar at the time, Van Reed, who is, which is a 12 page uh, compendium, no, sorry, 12 volume compendium covering about 790 medicinal plants of Malabar. It is a monumental work describing the medicinal plants of India. Mm -hmm. And I will briefly refer to it because uh, this next, Please feel free to copy this or photograph this if you want. The first um, uh, um, link will take you to the Hortus Malabaricus exhibition and the catalog, which was actually published by the NCBS. It's online. And I, uh, anybody who is interested, I suggest you take a you know, quick look at it because it takes you from the er very early part of you know, Indian medical knowledge systems, you know, referring to the Vedas and to the Bauer manuscript from the fourth century and so on and takes you into the first European books on Indian medicine and so on. The second one, which is more recent, uh, is a Google Cultural Institute exhibition, which was also assembled by me on behalf of the NCBS, and is now publicly available. It goes a little bit further. It actually talks not only about the scientific influences of India, but also the influences of India in the art and culture. I don't know, some of you may know about the famous exhibition that's going on right now, Vermeer exhibition at the, uh, at the museum in, uh, in uh, Holland. Uh, and uh, there are a number of paintings by the Dutch artist Vermeer, which has maps in the back. And it suggests that Vermeer was probably referring to the period while the Dutch East India Company was at its height and its major trade center in the beginning was India. So anyway, that's sort of beside the point a little bit. So I'm just introducing you to some material that I won't have a chance to cover. So this sort of summarizes the early part of the uh, Indian encounter with the West, with the with the world outside, especially in trade and in and and cultural exchange. This is a map that is taken by Abraham Ortelius, um, which is based on a very early text called the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. Travel and trade in the Indian Ocean by a merchant of the sixth of the first century. This merchant's diaries for have been actually this work has been translated into English and it's a wonderful read. He talks about travel to the west the west coast of India from Arabia to collect spices and medicines. So the knowledge about Indian medicines and the availability of natural products in India were widely known already in the beginning of the first millennium. And one of the things that I want to point out is that when I talk about Indian traditional knowledge, I'm talking about no everyday knowledge, folk medical knowledge, knowledge that was developed over centuries by individuals by trial and error that uh, took advantage of the natural products of India. So this is not text-based knowledge mostly that I'm referring to. I'm referring to the everyday knowledge of India, which had uh, achieved fame such that uh, foreigners, I mean, European, I mean the, the, the various um, merchants from the Middle East were coming to India, taking Indian commodities. And as you can see in that map at the corner, you can see uh, people trading, you know, and uh, an elephant with um, you know, carrying merchandise. This is, of course, a much later map. But India was already known in the first century as a resource for tremendously valuable natural products. And all of this was, of course, defined within India by experimentation. Uh, experimentation necessarily not, you know, uh, not restrict to what we now call the laboratory. Life was a laboratory. And so, but also I want then quick fast forward to the Middle Ages and the eminent scholar uh, Shlomo Goitian says that India trade was the backbone of the international economy in the Middle Ages and medicinal substances were supremely important commodities. So the Indian knowledge of medicinal substances and their validity were already known extensively by the end of the first millennium. So uh, lastly, before we move, I want you to see that Indian Peninsula is actually in the center of the trade map. And on both sides of the coastal areas, large number of cities which were engaged in trade with the outside world are noted. Okay, here we are. So the first Europeans to arrive in India were of course the Portuguese. 
because the initially Indian commodities were taken from India to the Middle East by you know, Arab and, and uh, Middle Eastern traders, and from there, you know, send off to, um, to the, the Europeans. At some point later on, of course, the Europeans decided to enter the spice trade directly. And the first uh, Europeans to arrive in India for trading purposes was Portuguese. And we all know the story of Vasco de Gama coming to Calicut in, 19, in 1498. And this is from a, an excerpt from a very famous tapestry called the Calicut Tapestries. These tapestries were commissioned by the King of Portugal upon Vasco de Gama's return. And it shows Vasco de Gama handing the King of Portugal a letter from the Samaran of Calicut. And apparently the letter uh, um, was you know, a letter of, uh, of a treaty between the Samaran and the, uh, and the Portuguese. And the, it says that, so, the King of Portugal then writes a letter describing the return of Vasco de Gama. And he says that, and there they, in Calicut, they loaded seven ships with spices and drugs, and they also brought some jewels. And so this is a translation from the you know, letter of the King of Portugal. So this was the beginning of the Portuguese and of the European enterprise of directly dealing with India. And you can see medicinal commodities were some of the primary things that the King mentions. Okay, but something that happens shortly after European arrival is that they were not prepared for this unexpected enemy, tropical diseases. Tropical diseases for which you know, Europeans had no remedies. And so Jan uh, Inshorten, who was a Dutch aide to the Portuguese archbishop, describes the condition of the Portuguese in, in Goa thus, or in the West Coast thus. They, they have many continual fevers basically that consume men's bodies with extreme heat. And within four or five days, they're either dead or alive, right? The sickness is common and very dangerous and has no remedy for the potent gallus but letting a blood, which was a very big treatment in Europe at the time, bleeding, okay? But the Indians and heathens do cure themselves with herbs. This is a translation from Alan Shorten's book. So besides this, there is another statement by the Dutch governor of Malabar at the time, uh, Hendrik van Rien and Reed, or van Rien. He, looking around at the condition of the health of the Malabarans, he says, they usually live to a great age and their health is cared for by native physicians who do not often fetch medicaments from other regions. Since they are content with only those medicaments their regions supply bountifully, a custom which is imitated by success with the Europeans. So this is the beginning of the uh, this is the beginning of the interaction between Indian medicine and Europeans, and the other reason, of course, for documenting Indian medical therapies by Europeans was also because it turns out Europe was actually using very large number of uh, medicines exported from India. In fact, there is a beautiful uh, document uh, by an Irish by a, by an American um, um, historian called Iris Origo. She talks about their book called Merchant of Prado. I wish I had the story to time to tell all these stories. And in this book, during the plague, the Merchant of Prado's household in Prado in Italy was using a large number of Indian medicines. And in fact, there is a bill of lading which shows how many Indian medicines derived from, were being used in this house and household of the rich merchant in Italy. But anyway, so but the Portuguese then also the, the Dutch also realizes that Indian medicaments are effective. And they are also extremely profitable, not only for use in India, but also for use in Europe and in Euro Europe's other colonies around the world. By 1700, by you know, by 1691, almost you know, 17th, 17th century, they were already um, exporting Indian medical substances to other or to other colony, uh, colonies in the tropics. So these are the reasons why Europeans are starting to document in such great detail Indian medical uh, information. And not only that, this was also 18th century, end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century was also the beginning of the study of systematic botany. Because it turns out that where from various parts of the tropics, Europeans were actually starting to assemble collection of exotic plants that they had never seen. So systematic botany becomes a scholarly a subject for study. And so uh, the other very important contribution was knowledge about Indian, med Indian plants, not only medicinal and otherwise, 
were being collected by European university gardens for study. And so um, they, the other items which were being shipped from India, as described by Van Reed himself here, is I have requested some of you orally to spend annually by homebound ships to the fatherland, all kinds of seeds, bulbs, plants, herbs, flowers, which all of you are able to collect in this district for a whole year. So medicinal gardens, botanical gardens, horticultural gardens, uh, 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 on tropical plants were being established all over Europe. And it says not only to satisfy the curiosity of many wise men and amateurs, but in order that they might, the world might enjoy and be served by the medicinal virtues. So again, the theme of medicinal virtues of indigenous plants in different contexts is one of the overwhelming driving themes for the documents that I'm going to show you soon. So one of the first books on Indian medicines that was assembled was assembled by the Portuguese uh, physician Garcia Orta. Garcia Orta was the uh, physician for the Viceroy of Goa. And in, in the middle of the 16th century, in, 1540, uh, in, the, uh, in 1563, Garcia Orta uh, published a book in Goa, in Portuguese, for the use of the Portuguese colony in Goa on Indian traditional medicines. And this was the beginning of the systematic study of Indian medicinal information by Europeans. And so on, in this text, Garcia Orta was a graduate of the prestigious Medical University of Salamanca in Spain. And so his reputation actually makes his book very much more acceptable to the European uh, scholarly community. And in this book, uh, Garcia Orta admits that there were some certain medicines that the Greeks did not know. So what happens is the book in Portuguese for the use of the Portuguese in Goa was then taken to Europe and all those numbers down below show you how rapidly this book's, book was and the content were translated into Latin, into Italian and French and was distributed throughout Europe and also in all the European colonies around the world. And this information, the other important part of Garcia Orta's book and I have actually given the English translation to the archives so if anybody wants to uh, look at it, it's in the archives. Very important thing that he very specifically describes the sources of the botanical medical knowledge that he has assembled in this book. Mostly he says that the scholar physicians were reluctant to work with these, uh, with Dr. Garcia Orta. The information that he gathered uh, was uh, from uh, physicians all around Goa, but. Uh, and it was also, he says that he even had collected information from his housemaid because there were folk medical knowledge which was only exclusively known by women at the period. Because as you probably know, even today in many rural areas in India, you know, women were, uh, had exclusive knowledge, exclusive, uh, exclusively dealt with diseases of women and children. And of course, in none of these books they are acknowledged, except Garcia Orta mentions by name his, his maid, who is able to go into the garden and collect something and bring it back to show it to one of his one of his collaborators. So this work, of course, as I said, was extremely important. And this book, uh, as I said, is translated into English, and we have now a translation in the archives. So this is just a list of the number of books that were published in rapid succession by Europeans. Of course, there is the work by Garcia Orta that I also mentioned. Then there is a book which was uh, written also by a Portuguese physician uh, who was in Kochi at the Royal Portuguese Hospital in Kochi. Very interesting book, which actually refers to the sources of the knowledge he collected. And he talks about going down with his translator into the villages around Kochi and talking to them about material, about individual medicinal plants. And that book, interestingly, was published in Spain because it was for the use, not in India, but by Spanish physicians and pharmacists using Indian medicines in Europe. And the other important thing about that particular volume, a very small one, and I will show you an image later, is that this is the very first time there are illustrations of Indian medicines. And so, so Cristobal Acosta, who also, as I said, was a physician, goes around the villages around Kochi, which is translated, and learns from local people what are the effective medicines that they were using for their everyday diseases. And Garcia on, and Acosta already includes sketches um, that he made in, um, uh, in Kochi and then was published 
in, uh, in Spain. And, and it's a very, very interesting book because of the reason that he refers to the fact that this was meant especially for physicians and pharmacists practicing in Spain. Then of course, there are commentaries by other Europeans on these two books that were published, especially the book by Caroli Cruzi, who is, was a botanist and a scholar in Amsterdam, who incorporates all this knowledge, which is in the books already published into his book, which was not only a book of medicines, but also a book of botany. And he was a respected uh, scholar and was one of the first directors of the Amsterdam you know, Botanical Garden. And therefore, you know, bot botany, Indian medical botany is now being incorporated into the study of scholarly botany and systematic botany in Europe. And last, of course, is the work by uh, Henrik van Rijn, which our 2008 exhibition was. Um, it is a monumental work that was, uh, oh, but before I move on, let me show you. This is one of the des descriptions in Acosta's book, the book that was published in Spain. This is, a, this is the, the way in which many of these medicines are described are extremely accessible. You can see this is a plant that you probably don't recognize from the image as much, but from the name, Karagapuli. In Malayalam, we, we call it Kodambuli. And so this is the description of the use of this medicine. You can Im immediately imagine that you can take this and think about, you know, this use is used by midwives to give women who give birth to expel the placenta and to produce milk. Immediately you think about muscle contraction, relaxation, what, you know, so there are, you can immediately extrapolate from these kinds of informations into scientific, into modern scientific, you know, thought. Not that it is giving you the, it's giving you clues about how these molecules and these active molecules might function. The other very important thing about this whole set of books is that all of them describe medicine, the properties of individual medicinal plants. Whereas classical medical, uh, traditional medicine is mostly describing formulations. Most of this fourth medicine derived knowledge describes medicinal properties of individual plants, which is of course a very important uh, resource. And this I'm showing you only because I want to show you some of the context, you know, some of the books themselves. This was taken from, from the exhibition at Stanford University. And I wanted to show you this because the illustrations in these works. The other very important aspect of it, especially the, the Hortus Malabaricus, which uh, our library, the NCBS library has a complete 12 volume of English translation, which is accessible to everyone, is that the illustrations are the first scientific illustrations of Indian medicinal plants ever done. In fact, of Asian medicinal plants. And these are beautifully done so that the plants can be identified very easily. And not only are the, the plants are often drawn to scale, and there are also you know, cross sections of individual parts of plants for easy identification. And um, so next, I want to give you a general um, look at how this knowledge report, reported in these books were assembled. And the only place where we get a complete honest evaluation of how the knowledge was assimilated and assembled is in the work by, uh, is in the Hortus Malabaricus. Because Van Reed, who had enormous respect for Indian scholars, describes the process by which the 12 volumes are assembled. This is the only view where we get, uh, where we know how the knowledge was derived. Now, it was not collected by experimentation by Europeans, it was assimilated. And therefore, here, so here I give you a list of how it was assembled. The compiler was the Dutch governor of um, Kochi, of the Dutch colony in Kochi. Then the knowledge sources were the Malabar folk physician, Itti Achidan, and three Ayurveda physicians. And why do I put the folk physician on top? Because this is the handwritten testimonial reproduced of the Malabar folk physician, Itti Achidan. You can see it takes almost one page of a folio volume. And it is in colored the script in old Malayalam. And you can read a little bit of the, of the translation here, even though it is in Latin. It says, I, Itti Achidan, Malabar doctor of the Chogo nation, a Gentile. I'm an Irava from a Gentile. You know, I'm from a community of Iravas. Here is, of course, the combined statement of the three Ayurveda physicians. And Professor Manilal, who has extensively translated this Hortus Malabaricus over a period of 30 years, and we had the honor of having him at the NCBS giving a lecture, 
has actually um, made the systematic study of the water smell of Argus over 30 years. And he has found that of the 790 plants that are described in the Hortus malabaricus, only 121 are from uh, the traditional Ayurvedic sources. The rest are from folk traditions of Malabar. And therefore, Ittiachud and his family, who are from a, a series, from a lineage of folk physicians, is considered to be the major contributor to the volume. So there you have the knowledge sources. And this is the only uh, document of all the, the books that I have looked at, European uh, works on Indian medicinal knowledge, where the contributors are distinctly acknowledged. And none of the other works, the sources are acknowledged. And in addition, the books are always published under the name of the persons who assemble. So Nathaniel Wallig, Daimok, all of these are text, texts are under the name of the, of, the, of the person who assembled the work. The knowledge sources are never acknowledged. Then, of course, it goes on to say that there were 15 more Malabar scholars of various types and plant collectors. Then the two, two European translators were involved because in this case, the knowledge had to come from Malayalam and Kannada to Latin, no, to Portuguese and from Portuguese to Latin. So the, inter inter the, the interconnection that is involved in assimilating Indian knowledge system is very, very complex. And except in the last group of papers that I'm going to talk about from the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, this was a very laborious process. And the very reason that they would set about to go through this process, it shows the importance of the accumulation of this knowledge, how essential it was for the early colonial enterprise. And of course, then there were artists, and we know there were Indian and, uh, of course, for, um, Dutch artists. Dutch artists are identified, but the Indian artists are not. But a series of drawings, there is a, the drawings for all of the illustrations in the 12 volume are in the British Library. And I, had, I was able to, I didn't, uh, able to find these uh, book of the original illustrations. And by comparing the drawing made in India of a person and the drawing made in, in the final volume, you can see that the original drawings were made by Indian artists, but of course they are not identified. So here is the complex system by which Indian indigenous knowledge was translated into Western books. Okay, and about the scholars themselves, uh, I wanted to show you this particular image for a number of reasons, not just as a decoration, because I wanted to show the images in the Hortus Malabaricus are often drawn to scale. So that, you know, here is a cardamom plant, and the way that the size of the cardamom plant, of course, is illustrated is by having a person next to it. But this is also very important because this is one of the earliest uh, drawings or illustrations of an Indian male ever published. Okay, So it's from a historical point of view. But here, this is a, um, a quote that Malabar, that, that Van Reed makes about the scholars from whom he gathered the information. And it's engraved in the, in the window in the hall as you come in the front door, the reception of NCBS. It says that some of them have no other occupation than temple service and are exempt from all worldly cares, being constantly occupied with genteel wisdom, stargazing. Stargazing is of course astronomy, another area where India had a tremendously important resource of knowledge and of course natural sciences. So this is the type of respect that Van Reed himself had for Indian scholars, but of course that is not the case for mostly most of the other uh, published, most of the other documenters. And I'm just going to show you some of the couple of the illustrations from the Hortus Malabar because these are folio volumes and they describe in great detail uh, the the illustration of the plants and also this is sort of a um, synopsis of the properties of the plants as described in the Hortus Malabaricus from, uh, from uh, Manila's English translation. So arachanets, which we are all fam or familiar with, of course are used for digestive um, and also digestive purposes and also as you know, purifiers. And of course we know now from, from modern science that arachaline is one of the um, molecules, is a very powerful molecule uh, with, with very strong properties. The other one I wanted to show you was Philandus uh, uh, you know, Nururi, which of course is also, and I'm sorry, Philandus Embolica, Philandus Nururi is on my mind because it has another very important property. So anyway, this, so 
the, the, the another important thing to notice about these illustrations are not only are they drawn to scale, but the name of the plant is given in uh, different scripts, in Malayalam scripts and Arabic scripts, Arabic script, and also in, you know, so that because this is before binomial nomenclature. So in order to relate the names of the plants, Malabar names, the, the names are engraved in, in different languages. Okay, so again, Hortus malabaricus had another very important function. My Hortus malabaricus was actually, as I said, the first systematic study of Asian botany, which was, and so all, so systematic study of systematic botany was a very important emerging field in Europe at the time. And these are all the documents that refer to the Hortus malabaricus, including the classic work by you know, Linnaeus. And, to 320 Malabar plants are listed in, in the book by Linnaeus. And many of the Malayalam names have actually made their way into binomial nomenclature. So a contribution of Indian botanical knowledge is not only for, for medicinal purposes, but has also helped to, to lay the groundwork for systematic botany. Okay, so we have now sort of looked at an overview of the Dutch and uh, and uh, Portuguese and Dutch documents in, on Indian medicine. But I'd like to bring to your attention a series of works that are much more accessible because they're all, they all in English, which were collected by the British East India Company. And of course, you know that the Fort St. George, British India Company, uh, when Fort St. George was one of the earliest settlements of the you know, British in India. And Fort St. George, shortly after the colony was established, uh, three different hospitals in rapid succession were established in Fort St. George, again bearing witness to the necessity for you know, dealing with tropical, tropical diseases. And, but the first of a series of papers, which was published, the earliest British paper, English papers on indigenous medicine were published from out of Fort St. George. And there were a series of seven papers published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And interestingly, they're accessible online, if any of you want to look at it. Um, the, so these were papers uh, which information collected by Samuel Brown, who was a physician, one of the Royal Hospitals in, in uh, Fort St. George, who had been living in, in this area for 17 years. And he was commissioned by the British East India Company to assemble and assimilate indigenous medical knowledge for their use in Fort St. George, Surat, in other, other British colonies in India. So at some point, these materials that he had collected was transmitted to the East India Company in London. East India Company then engages James Pettigrew, who was the fellow of the Royal Society, a botanist and an apothecary, to go over his material. So this is the origin of these papers. They're very interesting, and I really uh, urge you all to just take a glance. So, so the collector is Samuel Brown, and he is the principal surgeon in Madras at the time. He collected approximately information on about 300 individual medicinal plants. Now, this interesting is because this was information he collected from other physicians working in the Madras area, both indigenous physicians and also British physicians who found these medications to be effective. So that is a very important, you know, important for the East India Company because their own surgeons were certifying to the efficacy of these Indian medicine plants. So, so then um, he was also commissioned by the British East India Company in rapid succession to send plant specimens, seeds, cuttings, and preserved herbarium sheaves to England so they could build their own library on information on medicinal plants from India to be used in other parts of the tropical colonies. And here is an image of a pressed specimen that, James, uh, that Samuel Brown sent, sent to the British East India Company, which is in the Natural History Museum in London. And if anybody who wants to learn more about it, I suggest you look at this paper by Alice Marcos. She goes extensively into this period, and all, especially on to this collection of British East India Company and the collection and of James Pettigrew. So James Pettigrew was, of course, a member of the Royal Society, had a very high reputation. And so East India Company basically commissions him to assemble, to, you know, to edit in our modern terms, the information that was being sent by James Pettigrew. So he then builds a collaboration with 
uh, Samuel Brown. And Samuel Brown then over the years has, you know, enhances the collection. And so the papers in the philosophical transactions are the information that uh, was sent by Samuel Brown, but annotated with uh, other European texts on India, Indian flora, and especially the Hortus Malabaricus, because the Hortus Malabaricus had just been published. And James Pettiver, being a fellow of the Royal Society, of course, was one of the critiques evaluators of the, of the uh, Hortus Malabaricus. So here is a, in a synopsis of why this material is important. So here you have Samuel Brown from India sending it to James Pettiver. He's editing James uh, this material. And this is a page from the philosophical transactions. But what I want to see why this material is really uh, significant is because Samuel Brown actually they gives the following detail, place and date of collection. Now, remember, any one of you who is a botanist know that the time of collection uh, or the, or, of the plant is very important because we know that secondary metabolites in plants are, you know, very, okay? and of course, it gives, describes the plant, you see the medicinal properties. In this case, uh, I'm going to tell you which plant it is, but it cures coughs, ulcers, and so on, and part of the plant, okay? And then it also gives the uh, way the, it should be prepared, the decoction of the root. Okay? And natives also use it boiled in butter. There is some lipid extraction or something going on there. Okay? So then uh, James Pettiver, of course, you know, goes on to describe, relate the plant <laughs> to other um, descriptions of similar plants from other parts of the tropics. So the bottom part is he identifies the plant uh, as such and such plant from volume five, page 71 of Hortus Malabaricus. So this cross-referencing gives very much validity to these seven uh, papers in the, in the philosophical transactions. And so here is a description of the plant. What it does, this particular plant takes away swelling, uh, abates sharpness of the urine, eases the tone, so on and so forth, and suggests perhaps diuretic properties and so on. So depending upon what you read in it, you can then start to sort of explore what its individual molecular characteristics might be. But here from Hortus malabaricus, we know uh, the cross-referencing, cross we know which plant it is. So this is a really interesting group of papers. Uh, since I'm running out of time, I'm gonna rush through. Um, so this is, then we are going to look at, just I'm gonna just show you the cover pages of a large number of English documents that were published in the 18th and 19th century. And one reason, of course, was not only the, I mean, ad additional reason was not only the medicinal values of Indian plants, it's also because according to, you know, Hooker, who was one of the major publishers of India, he said that India represents perhaps the richest and is certainly the most varied botanical region on the face of the globe. You know that two of the large, most important biodiversity hotspots are in India, one, one in the Malabar region. And of a great degree, any other contains representatives of the flora of the Eastern and Western hemispheres. So the British set about to document Indian botanical, Indian botanical knowledge for agricultural, medicinal, and horticultural purposes. And this just shows you just a collection. But again, we want to know that here is Royal, here is Hooker, so on and so forth. But none of these documents acknowledge the individual sources. And we know these materials were collected over a period of time by groups of people who put together these documents. And rushing through to the next place, I want to point out three other um, books from this here, from the large collection of British books. Again, as a source for those of you who might be interested in these books for you know, scientific reasons. This is a very, very important book very well defined. It is a, a catalog of Indian medicinal plants and drugs, indeed intended chiefly for the gentlemen of the medical profession on their first arrival in India. And to whom it must be desirable to know what article of Mephir Medica this country affords and what, why, by what name that you may find them. So again, these are very, very pointed descriptions of medicinal plants with identification and also descriptions. And here, uh, Fleming says, this is a path by which this information is collected by Fleming. So bear with me while I read this to you. 
So it says, Dr. Patrick Russell, by in, informed by the physician general at Madras, that he had known this route is used by European and native troops with great success for dysentery. And Dr. Anderson, who is some other physician also working in India, finding the practice of the black doctors much more successful than his own, was not ashamed to take instruction from it. So this assimilation of knowledge is a group effort that while the physician is passing information back and forth, collecting them from individual Indian practitioners. So that, I really like that quote because for once it, it shows how much information was gathered and how it was all put together. Another book, which is also very interesting is the work by Royal. And even though um, it, he says that the book was intended for showing the immense resources of British India, both that regards whatever is necessary in agriculture, manufacturing, and internal trade of, per, uh, trade of people, because by that time, economic wealth of India becomes a very important part of the British um, you know, assimilation of information in India. But, but as for the supply of much extended commerce, but much attention is still being paid to the material medical of India. And lastly, uh, a, another book, which is on specifically on the Basar medicines of India. And this book was considered to be important enough because Waring was not only a physician, but he was also a pharmacologist. And the effectiveness of the book was so uh, widely um, appreciated that the book was in, in, translated into Tamil and also into Malayalam under the auspices of the uh, Travangur Maharaja. I'm just flying through this because I just want to give you a flavor of the amount of material that is out there. And but of course, then by the time it gets to be the latter part of the uh, 19th century, Stuart Anderson from the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine says 50% of the drugs in the official British pharmacopoeia were indigenous to India and Ceylon. Okay. Um, and of course, there was the Bengal pharmacopoeia, which also incorporated indigenous drugs. So this was a major source of early, uh, early and even later uh, European um, col colonies in India. It's, so again, I just want to reiterate the fact that the knowledge assimilated in these volumes was of course you know, contributed by people from many levels of Indian society. This is a um, frontispiece of an unpublished manuscript, which is in the Nation, Natural, National Museum in Paris. And it shows a scholar, a European, a physician, a artist, a probably a plant collector, and a woman who is carrying a collection of plants on her. On her. Okay. Now, again, as we had just a brief conversation, women were a very important part of the medical literature, medic medical knowledge system of India. Because as I said, diseases of women and children were mostly uh, uh, based on knowledge collected by women. And of course, that tradition of women being important in the medical profession, you know, of course, has carried on in the modern India. India probably had the, one of the first all med women's medical college in the world at some point. So anyway, this again, shows that the scholars and practitioners from all levels of Indian society are the source of medical knowledge in European documents. And finally, uh, a comment on European works on Indian plants as a resource for contemporary study. Most are collected from regional folk healers. And as was the case uh, from Dr. Manilal's work, even out of the 797 plants in the 12 volume Portis Malabaricus, only 121 are from the classical Ayurvedic texts. The others are all folk knowledge. And given the fact that folk knowledge and the resources are, are, are you know, vanishing at such you know, um, amazing pace, these volumes uh, are very important resources. And secondly, most plants, most of the medications included in these European texts uh, uh, that I already, are actually properties of single plants, not formulations. And lastly, identities and properties of these medicinal plants are often cross-referenced 
with other existing reports from other parts of the tropics, giving it you know, some more validity cross-referencing. And lastly, um, they were mostly reported in these European checks because physician networks had agreed to, on some validation of this material. That's important also because physicians from other, many parts of these British you know, colonies were actually passing information back and forth such that they are already in use by you know, colonists in many places. And perhaps we can call it some sort of user-based validation, perhaps. And lastly, this is my favorite slide. I want to offer this to you guys as a challenge and as sort of a reminder of history. In 1954, Rustam Bakil, a physician uh, in St. Edward's Ho Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, was awarded the Lasker Award for studies on the use of reserpine in the treatment of hypertension. This is a quote from the Lasker Award. It says, so I continue to read from the Lasker Award uh, statement. The story of Ravolthia Serpentina is an example of a block in medical communication that in retrospect seems hard to understand. This drug has been in use in ancient Ayurvedic medicine of India. Not only, I add a correction there, not only in just Ayurvedic medicine, actually Sarpaganthi is a Basar medicine plant. Okay. For hundreds of years and had been the subject of modern scientific research in India since 1931. Yet while innumerable fruitless efforts were being followed by Western medicine, this important one, one was overlooked until the attention was finally focused on it by, Rastam, by Dr. Vakil. It's interesting is that reserpine, you know, a sarbaganthi plant was used in traditional medicine as an antidote for snake bite. It also was used as a, as a um, for diseases of the mind, neurological effects. It turns out uh, the molecule identified from sarbaganthi, reserpine, and also chlorpromazine, if I remember correctly, was essential for, for establishing some of the fundamental parts of neural pathways. So the, the uh, function, the, you know, the, the mind altering properties, you know, and the anti-venom properties all comes together in modern research. But the irony of it is that the scientific name of uh, Sarpaganthi refers to the, 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 the fact that it has something to do with the snake, right, Sarpaganthi. So reserpine, so it is Ravolfia serpentina. So serpent has some to do with serpentine. But Ravolfia was actually, Ravolf was a 18th century German physician who came to India to do some studies on traditional medicine. How they connected uh, Ravolfia, I mean, Ravolf with, with this plant remains a mystery to me. But this is also another very important aspect of this type of knowledge assimilation. Uh, the, this is, of course, scholars, many scholars are now writing about this issue of knowledge assimilation, but these little windows into how these things happened is really quite amusing. So lastly, just a note, 25% of drugs used in modern medicine contain bioactive compounds derived from or modeled after uh, natural products. Of course, two of the most famous examples are the two medicines for malaria, quinine and artemisinin. Both were, of course, derived from plants, and, and quinine, I mean, artemisinin and artemisinin derivatives still remain the most effective treatment for malaria. And of course, we have a list of 50 medicinal plants that we published in the, in the exhibition in 2008, starting with aspirin, that were actually either uh, identified originally from uh, natural products, but many of them have been synthesized. And so, again, a quote from, um, from uh, BNAS saying the plant extracts offer a unique alternative therapeutic strategy to otherwise intractable diseases. Natural compounds for which innocuous long-term use in human populations are being documented might be more tolerable and acceptable in disease prevention. And I, if anybody who is interested in exploring this question further, I refer you to a paper I published last year looking at single medicinal plants. So that almost finishes Oh, just this is almost this is the end. With rapid loss of regional medical practitioners and folk medical knowledge, the European books on Indian regional therapies are valuable resources to be revisited with contemporary scientific methods. So that's just an invitation for all of you uh, in your spare time 
to go to the library, take a look. You you don't know when the what, you know who which of you will be in the next restaurant walking. Yes. So this is just uh, some of the libraries and and uh, museums who kindly let me into their internal archives and allowed me to wander around in them. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we have time for a few questions and then I'll answer for them. Uh, we can maybe do about three questions and then perhaps we can try to You know, the, the Indian knowledge system is more about the way uh, the knowledge is transferred. It's usually familiar. So. Yes, yes, lineages, yes. And uh, outsiders of country to get it has to be the same community. So how was this possible for all the Europeans to get knowledge about the combinations of the details? Well, mostly probably they were, you know, uh, when I have extensively interviewed uh, uh, several of the uh, late Ashtavadiyas of Kerala, and it is really true that um, knowledge from such lineages are often really closely guarded. And in the case of Van Reed, we have some idea how it happened because Van Reed himself was very sympathetic, very, very, um, ad he admired he, uh, the knowledge of indigenous physicians. And therefore he was able to uh, interact with them with respect. Okay. In the case of the British uh, uh, collection of these materials, they must have been uh, accumulated over a long period of time. See, we have no reference. We don't really know. All we know is that between the British physicians, this information was carried on, you know, was transmitted. But also, that, again, these were mostly not uh, collected from scholar physicians. Um, Garcia Oata, for example, in the first book that I referred to, specifically states the scholar physicians were, will not, were not um, willing to speak to the Europeans. Yeah, you said some of them are folk healers. Yes, most of, them are most of them are folk. Most of this information is folk knowledge. As I said, even in the 12 volumes and 790 plants, only 121 are from the classical text. So it is obviously some sort of interaction that they were able to establish over time that, that divulged that type of knowledge. And you saw one of the statements where it says, they were very respectful of, of the black physicians because they could do things we cannot do. Not by using force. Uh, well, hopefully not, because the knowledge cannot be extracted by force, right? I mean, probably can, but mostly not, I hope. Uh, fantastic. Uh, curious, maybe a slightly different question. I was wondering, uh, just in terms of biodiversity, Biodiversity, yeah, yes. There is a lot of yes. biodiversity also in uh, similar latitudes, yes. Africa, Southeast Asia, yeah. uh, you know, in islands Southeast Asia. Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, uh, do you think that uh, traditional use of uh, plants in those areas, did it not grow? Was it not, or is it just something which we're not, we're not discussing today? Is it not there as much? Well, or there, is it neglected? I think it does I, seem like a focus on uh, you know, biodiversity. I was just curious. Well, about. there is a very important uh, series of works that were published in out of Southeast Asia, which was modeled after the Hortus Malabaricus. And those volumes are, are some of the seminal uh, recordings of uh, medicines of Southeast Asia. You know, I, 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 the name is not coming to me right now, but it closely resembles the Hortus Malabaricus. That is a very, very important group of works. Yes, Southeast Asia was, a, you know, and also because of the Buddhist, you know, tradition and the communication between South Asia and the Southeast Asia, there was tremendous amount of exchange of information that includes medicine. And in fact, you know, the traditional Indian medical systems, Ayurveda, for example, very much influenced medicine in those parts of the world. In Africa, unfortunately, there are very few records that I have been able to uh, be able to find. Traditionally, certainly, even today, and this is one of the first, another very important areas, even today, even in India, biomedicine and traditional medicine coexist. But there's no documentation on how often a patient relies on uh, traditional medicine for what types of diseases and therapies and how this interaction is happening in India. Yes, in Africa and some parts of Southeast Asia still, for chronic diseases, traditional medicine is still 
the first line of defense. And do we have any documentation? No. Uh, I just I wanted to build on this first what we just mentioned about the coexistence of these natural remedies and uh, other types of medicine in India. So there's also this divide between uh, folk remedies and what you would call an allopathic remedy. Yes. So why? Because in the records you can see that uh, all these colonizing, uh, the colonial, colonial enterprise heavily relying on uh, indigenous knowledge. So why do you think the divide came up where now it is uh, not so much relied upon anymore? And how do you think we can uh, sort of bridge that so that you know people don't think of like you know these two in two separate terms, but uh, we have a more synergistic approach here. Well, this is actually a very interesting question, and in fact, one of the things that I spent some time at the Kota Galadhyayadishala, which is in North Malabar. It's one of the only places in India that I know of where there is some attempt to integrate biomedicine and traditional medicine. In fact, when I was there in the maybe 2000, not a long time ago, any patient who came into Kota Galadhyayadishala Hospital was actually reviewed by a biomedical physician and an Ayurvedic physician. And they, between the two of them, made the uh, decision of if this chronic illness, should you treat them with steroid or should you convince them that an Ayurvedic medicine, which would be effective over a, maybe a period of three months or something would be much more, you know, would be equally effective and less harmful. So that type of integration and cooperation is actually in very few places. In fact, uh, there was an attempt in the early 1900s by the, by the government of Kerala to require that um, physicians be educated, more biomedical physicians be educated even briefly in what a traditional medical systems, in this case, of course, systematic Ayurvedic medicine could do, but that, that attempt did not succeed, partly because of the reluctance on the part of the uh, biomedical physicians, because they were convinced they have the latest and the best. So I think that is an issue that really should be pursued because if I am in a lecture room and I ask, you know, uh, raise your hands, how many of you have used traditional medicine in the last six months? You know, thylum or even a decoction, half, more than half the people have. So that is a challenge for medical system in India to educate the modern, the biomedicine on the value of our traditional medicine and where they can be applicable and effective. And also the second part, of course, is the patient population. The patient population has to be educated on the adverse consequences of long-time therapy with molecular medicine, because in many cases, leaving adverse long-lasting consequences and convincing them of the benefits of more um, you know, systematic reduction of poisons and other things that make, you know, bring you back to health. That, that is a real challenge. Yes. In fact, the interest is known that in the year 1835, in Calcutta, they used to have 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 Chinese history and Chinese you know, I know very little. I have looked into it a little, but I think that Chinese government, China has actually put, uh, in general, the population is much more amenable to traditional medicine. And of course, the success of things like artemisinin, you know, which won UU2, the Nobel Prize, has given them much more faith and confidence in the effectiveness of their medicine. So I think in Chinese medicine is actually, um, by the government put on a more systematic uh, study level. And recently, for example, I read, a, I saw a paper uh, for a derivative of the turmeric plant uh, being uh, possibly a treatment for a certain type of oral and neck cancers, which is also a Chinese paper. So I think Chinese medicine, and I don't really know the, all of the you know, nitty gritties of how this is happening, but certainly, you know, study the, the uh, events like the artemisinin, of course, gives Chinese medicine 
and a tremendous credibility. That's all I can say. I would be guessing. I'm just curious because some of the cultural issues especially are taking so how did the Chinese deal with it? Deal with? Well, some of the cultural and ethnicity issues that Shashili and Anush are touching. I was just curious about how the Chinese dealt with this. You know, I don't really know, but I think, you know, uh, this, the system is, of course, much more, what's the word? You know, I think, I don't know. I think I would be saying something and I could be, I could say something negative and which wouldn't be good. So yeah, there is obviously much more faith in, and it's supported very much by the government. And uh, they have the physicians have, uh, traditional physicians have actually uh, a, a very good status. All of those, I think, can, can, you know, uh, contribute to the cultural um, willingness to embrace Chinese medicine. But again, as I said, a validation of a drug like artemisinin goes a long way. Thanks so much. I have a question about the translation. I found that very uh, interesting when they translated the knowledge was translated from Malayalam to Portuguese and then to. Uh, yeah, then, then, to ta then to Latin. Yeah, so I was just curious like, when you were researching the records, because with translation, there can be a lot of. Uh, yes, there can be. And in fact, yeah. Or sometimes it's even funny that sometimes they don't have a local context. Yeah, in fact, that's that's a good point that you raised. But I think this is where Professor Manila did an invaluable service. He independently translated the Hortus Malabarifus over a period of 30 years with the help of two Catholic priests who knew Latin. So he is a systematic botanist. And so he was able to make his own independent translation. And in the collection in the library, uh, for every medicinal plant, he makes annotations. And he says that actually this point is wrong. So yes, the Portuguese uh, the, from Malayalam and from Kannada, it was translated into the Portuguese by a, a, a person who was half Portuguese and half Malayalam. So he knew supposedly the terminologies. From there, it was taken to Latin by Caesarius. So there is error, errors in there, but I think the comparing it to uh, Manila's translation and his major contribution is actually making those corrections. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the implementation teams, the and the Thank you very much.